There's a story of a Jewish man around the time of Jesus. He was a Roman citizen with a deep disdain for followers of Christ. In fact, he would lead the charge to persecute the early church. Going door to door, he would drag away Christian men and women and throw them in prison. He would even go as far as to affirm the murder of Stephen, history's first Christian martyr. One day while traveling, he encountered the very Christ in which he was persecuting. Jesus would graciously and miraculously transform the life of the man that we know as the Apostle Paul. Jesus would ultimately reveal his gospel directly to Paul, using him to spread it throughout the nations. Paul would go on to take four missionary journeys, personally planting dozens of churches, reaching and influencing hundreds of thousands of people for the kingdom of God. In 57 AD, Paul would articulate the gospel given to him by Christ Jesus in a letter to the church in the center of the universe, the Roman Empire. This letter would become the source of spiritual revival and awakening for hundreds of thousands of people over the last 20 centuries. Because what Paul knew then still reigns true today, that the gospel of Jesus is the gospel for everyone. Welcome. My name is Jason. I'm one of the pastors here. We are honored that you've chosen to start your week off by worshiping with us here at Quad City Christian Church. I want to welcome all of those who are joining us online from whenever and wherever you are. So grateful to have you. And want to welcome all of those in PV today. So we're so glad uh, that you are with us today. Uh, we are kicking off a brand new series. Now, before I jump into that, I do want to just say I know here at our Prescott campus, it is a little more crowded in here. We had to put out a few extra chairs. I just always want to remind you, we do have other options. So there is an 8 o'clock service here that you can come to. There is an 11 o'clock. So I'd encourage you to uh, jump into one of those if it's a little too close for comfort in here, and I know the same is in PV. The 930 is always uh, more crowded than the 11, so if you're looking for a little extra room, you can jump into that 11 o'clock service there in Prescott Valley as well. Uh, today, we are kicking off Romans. Uh, you should have a book like this somewhere near you. Uh, as you came in, you probably received that or found it on your chair. I want to invite you to grab those. This is going to be a part of our study in the book of Romans. So really want to encourage you to bring this back with you. Uh, if you are a person that says, you know what, I'm not, I'm not going to use that, then just leave it, please. Like they, they are, uh, we are giving those away. We are giving them away, but they're not free. And so if this is not a tool that you will use, please just leave it there in your seat. One of our uh, uh, team, mem team members will pick it up at the end of the service. Uh, chances are we're going to run short today anyway. So if you don't want it, perfectly fine. Leave it. Let us make sure that everybody who does want one has a chance to get one. And I would encourage you, please put your name in the front of it because you will leave it here like legit. You're going to leave it under the chair and then you're going to call the church and then we're going to have 12 of them and we're going to say, I don't know. I would, what's your handwriting look like? I don't know. So put your name in it. That'd be really helpful. Uh, I would also say if you don't like the little three rings on there, the reason we did that is because you are going to, we're going to add to these every month. So you're going to get a new stack as we go through this series. So this is going to get pretty thick. If you would rather, you can go to the Walmarts and get you one of these little notebooks. They are hole punch to fit in there. So if you'd rather have a little notebook, just make sure you get the inch finder there. So we're kicking off Romans today. Um, and we're calling it the gospel for everyone. And the reason is, you'll find out over the next few weeks. The If you're a newcomer with us, I, I, let me begin with this. If you're a newcomer with us, um, one of our core values is we say we teach the Bible. Like we want to we wanna 
teach not just themes from the Bible, but texts of the Bible. And so what that means for us oftentimes is we just pick a book of the Bible and just go through it, line by line, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And that's what we're going to be doing in the book of Romans. If you've been around Quad City for a while, we've done this on several uh, different big books of the Bible. But Romans is likely going to be the longest series that we've ever done somewhere north of 40 weeks. Yeah, I know. I feel the groan, right? Oh, my God. If that feels overwhelming for you, imagine being me. All right? Just. So the question then becomes, well, why would we do, the, why would we do that? Why would we, why would we dedicate that much time to one series, to one book of the Bible? And so I was thinking about that as I was preparing for this, and I thought, you know what? The book of Romans, if you know anything about it, there's a lot of quarreling and debating and division around the book of Romans. People, different ideas about what it means, and, and it can be pretty divisive. But I thought that since that, that we in America are experiencing such unrivaled peace and unity and camaraderie in our culture and in our churches, that, that we could handle now any disagreements that might come up from Romans. Right? I figure, good timing. And I feel like, like over the last two years collectively, that we as a people, just generally as a culture, that we've obtained such high levels of self-awareness and self-confidence and humility <laughs> that no one will get offended by the seemingly offensive things that Romans has to say to us. I mean, I feel like we've grown past being triggered by hearing things that we don't like. Right? So it's good timing. And then I was like, okay, in, over the last 18 months or so, I just feel like, I feel like I've just, I feel like I've preached maybe a few too many um, cream puff sermons around here. And that we probably just need something of substance to really talk about in our life groups. I feel like there's just been a little too much ear candy in, in this place. And this might give us some meat something to hang on to. Um, actually, none of that's true. The reality is, I've preached here for 14 years, and I've gone exegetically through most of the New Testament, and frankly, I was just running out of options. So it was either like Romans or Revelation. So that was my options, and so I went, went with Romans. Actually, that's not even true. The reality is, why Romans? In all seriousness, why Romans? And the answer to why Romans is because Romans is one of the most profound works of literature, not just in the Bible, but in all of history. The study of the book of Romans has led to nearly every great revival in the last 2,000 years. And some of the most influential people in Christianity point back to a study and understanding of the book of Romans as the catalyst for their own faith. Let me give you just a couple of examples. You probably heard of the early church father Augustine. He was a monk who was tormented by by his faith. He didn't understand what was happening. He's, he recounts the story of being 32 years old, sitting under a fig tree, just tormented about his faith. He's broken down in tears and he says, I, I heard a voice that said, pick up and read. And he goes and he grabs his Bible and he flips it open to Romans chapter 13 and he read verses 13 and 14, two verses out of the book of Romans. And then here's what he says. He says, I neither wished nor needed to read further. At once, with the last words of this sentence, it was as if a light of relief from all anxiety flooded into my heart and all the shadows of my doubt were dispelled. That God used a small text in Romans to light up Augustine's faith. You may have heard of a guy named Martin Luther. He was the father of the Protestant movement. And he said it was his study and contemplation of Romans chapter 1 verse 17 that was the light bulb moment for him. He says, night and day I pondered until I grasped the truth 
that the righteousness of God is the righteousness whereby through grace and sheer mercy he justifies us by faith. Thereupon I felt myself to be reborn and to have gone through the open doors in the paradise. It was Romans 1.17 that he says, that was the moment I came to faith, was understanding this one part of Romans. He would later write about the whole of Romans. He would later write that it is the true masterpiece of the New Testament. The very purest gospel, which is well worthy and deserving that a Christian man should not only learn it by heart, word for word, but, sh that, but that he should daily deal with it as the daily bread of men's souls. For it can never be too much or too well read or studied. And the more it is handled, the more precious it becomes and the better it tastes. Martin Luther says, Romans is not the gospel that you hear once and you move on. No, no, no. Every single day. This is the bread of our souls. We should relish ourselves in the gospel. Know it by heart, word for word. That's, that's how he felt about the book of Romans. There's a guy named John Wesley, who many of you know the Wesleyan movement. Started the Methodist churches. He is, he, again, points back to the book of Romans that he, he said he went to a church in England on a Sunday night and somebody in the church simply got up and began reading the introduction to Martin Luther's commentary on Romans. Just reading the introduction to Martin Luther's commentary. And here's what Wesley says. He, meaning Martin Luther, was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ and I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for my salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken my sins away, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. Like these amazing men, theologians, scholars point back to a study and understanding of Romans for bringing them to true faith in Jesus. There's a pastor in England named uh, John Stott. And John Stott, who was named in 2005, he was named on the list of Time Magazine's most 100 influential people alive. And here's what he says. He says, Romans is a timeless manifesto of freedom through Christ Jesus. It is the fullest, plainest, and grandest statement of the gospel in the New Testament. And this is why we want to study it. We believe it is the grandest, plainest, fullest explanation of the gospel that we have. And it is well worth us spending the better part of a year digging into what it has to teach us. But again, I want you to understand, I gave you a bunch of theologians and scholarly elites, but this letter was not written to a bunch of scholarly elites. It was written to a bunch of people just like us. Sitting in a church, trying to understand what faith in Jesus looks like. It's not something we should be scared of, but it should be something that we are eagerly anticipating. Having God speak to us through. So, that's what we're going to do over the next better part of a year. Now, today is just the introduction. So if you walk out of here and say, well, we really didn't talk about Romans much. It's because this is the introduction. We're just laying the groundwork today. This is just the foundation. Okay, so I want to begin by giving the bigger, broader context of the book of Romans. And to do that, we're going to do like you did in your literature class back in high school, where you had to work through the who, what, when, where, and why. So that's what we're going to do today, go through the five W's real quick, who, what, when, where, and why. So if you are a note taker, grab your notebooks here, there's a page, you can write these down the who, what, when, where, and why. And we're going to start with who. And we're going to answer the question today, who wrote it and who did he write it to? So that's where we're going to begin today. Who wrote it? Well, Romans chapter 1, verse 1 begins like this. Paul, and a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. So, like most ancient letters... They write the name of the person writing the letter at the very beginning. The, the author introduces himself. And they introduce himself as Paul, a servant of Christ, and a, called to be an apostle. 
So we're smart people and we put it together and we call him the Apostle Paul. See how that works? We'll talk more about him specifically next week, but just recognize that's who's writing this. A guy named the Apostle Paul. And he wrote 13 of the 27 books of the New Testament. And that's the Apostle Paul. But this one is by, and by, by far the largest, most significant of all of the letters that he wrote in the New Testament. So we'll talk about him more next week. Who did he write it to? Well, Romans 1.7 tells us who it was written to. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people. So the Apostle Paul is writing it. To the Christians in Rome, those who are loved by God in the city of Rome, Italy. Now, what's interesting about this letter, as opposed to all the other letters that the Apostle Paul wrote, is the Apostle Paul did not start this church. Like most of the letters that we have in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul are writing to churches that he established. Like he would go into Philippi or Corinth. Or Thessalonica, and he would share the gospel, and he'd plant a church. And then he would write these letters corresponding back and forth with these churches that he had established. That's not true of this church. Paul had nothing to do with the start of this church in Rome. We, up to this point, we'll learn by the time we get out of chapter 1, he's never visited these Christians. He's never met them. When you read like the letter to the Philippians... He loves those people. He knows those people. He baptized many of those people. They've supported him in his ministry. None of that is true for these Christians in Rome. He has no connection with them. He's only heard about them from a distance. He wants to meet these people. He's longing to go see these people, but it hasn't happened yet. Which begs the question, well then how did this church begin? Who started this church in Rome? And the Short answer is we don't really know. Now, for those of you who come from a Catholic background, the the Catholic tradition is that the Apostle Peter started the church in Rome. But we don't have any biblical evidence of that. And we don't have actually any real historical evidence that Peter established this church. Um, In fact, Peter was specifically called the apostle to the Jews, so it would be a little bit off-brand for him to launch a church in Rome. So that would be a little off-brand. We don't have any historical evidence that Peter was actually ever in Rome before this church began. So where did it start? We can't know for certain. If you ask me, I think this church began at Pentecost. Let me give you The background of why I believe that. Acts chapter 2. You may remember the day of Pentecost when the apostles are in the upper room and the Holy Spirit comes down and Peter's filled with the Spirit and they they begin to preach the gospel in languages that everybody from the empire can understand. And the text in Acts chapter 2 says, now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. So All of the people, all Jewish people from all over the Roman Empire were in Jerusalem and they hear the gospel. There were people from every nation under heaven. Perinthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya near Cyrene. And then we have, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism. So part of the crowd that heard Peter proclaiming the gospel on the day of Pentecost, in that crowd were visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism. Now the details of this little highlighted section is really interesting. None of these other places are described as visitors. But they're visitors from Rome. Nobody else is described as a visitor. Like there were people in Rome in Jerusalem, who heard the gospel, but they weren't planning on staying in Jerusalem. They were going home. They were just visiting Jerusalem. And it's interesting to note that it says, in this conglomerate from Rome, there were both Jews and converts to Judaism. In other words, there were, there were Jews, but there were also Gentiles who had converted to Judaism, which gives us a flavor of the church in Rome which as we study the book, we'll learn is full of both Jews and Gentiles. And that 
culture clash impacts a lot of what we're going to read in the book of Romans. And from the very beginning, we're told that's who's making up these visitors from Rome. So if you were to ask me, I think this day, these visitors from Rome heard the gospel preached by Peter. They were part of the 3,000 who were baptized that day. They, on the, by the time you get to Acts chapter 8, they are the ones who flee from the church in Jerusalem or sent out by persecution and they go back home and they make up the church that we call Roman, Romans. So, that's my guess. That's the who. Brings us now to the what. What is the book of Romans? In its simplest form, it's a letter. It's a letter. But it's not just any letter. It is actually the most significant letter that we have from all of ancient history. Most letters that we have from antiquity are somewhere around 90 words. 90 words. More, uh, more uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Literary letters can get up to about 200 words. Paul was always a little more wordy. Most of his letters in the New Testament are around 1,300 words. This letter is 7,100 words. It is the biggest, grandest letter that we have from all of antiquity. It's not a normal letter. This is Paul expounding and explaining the gospel of Jesus with greater heights and deeper depths than anyone ever has in history. It is 16 chapters long, and I want to give you an admittedly overly simplistic outline of these 16 chapters, okay? Admittedly overly simplistic. I'll put it all up here, then you can snap your picture, take it, reference it later. Here's the outline. It begins with Paul simply, hey, you. Like, this is the intro. The first 17 verses. Hey, guys, let me introduce myself. Haven't met you. You haven't met me. Looking forward to seeing you. So that's the beginning, okay? So that's the first 17 verses. And then we get to chapters 1 through 4, and it's the bad news. And I say bad news, and I just need you to know up front it's worse than you thought. Like, this is going to be the section where you're going to want to quit. Like, you're going to be, you're going to feel real bad about yourself. And you're going to not like me. I'm figuring, I'm figuring by week five, you're going to be ready to pull the ripcord. Like, I'm out. Okay? It's the bad news. And it's bad news. But don't quit during the bad news. Because when we get to chapters four through eight, that's the good news. It's the good news. I love how pastor, a pastor named Tim Keller describes the gospel. Here's what he says. He says, the gospel is this, that we are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet, at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Christ Jesus than we ever dared hope. In other words, it's worse than you thought. And it's greater than you could dream. And we're going to experience both of those realities. We can't skip over the bad news. Because it is understanding the bad news that makes the good news so glorious. There is no good news of the gospel. Unless there's bad news to begin with. So, hang with me through the bad news. Because it's the bad news that makes the good news glorious. Chapters 9 through 11, I call this the hard news. It's the hard news. Because for many, it's hard to understand this section, 9 through 11. For those that he is talking about, it's hard to imagine. The things that he's saying are hard to imagine. For those that he's talking to, what he's saying is really hard to hear. And in this section, Paul gives us a really harsh warning for those with hard hearts. And we are going to see Paul heartbroken. Because of it. Chapters 12 through 15, this is the what to do. So we're going to hear the gospel laid out, and then through chapters 12 through 15, Paul's going to apply the gospel to our life. Like, what do we do because of it? What's the point? 
How does it change my life? What am I supposed to do now? So that's the what to do section. And then the last section is see you soon. So this is chapter 16. It's one of my favorite parts of the whole book. It is Paul talking about his desire to go visit the people of Rome and throwing out some accolades to some people in the church of Rome. And I can't wait to get to that section. So this is a simple outline. And I'll try as we go through this series to help you understand, to point to when we're transitioning from one section to the other. Okay? So there you go. Hopefully you got your picture. So that's the, that's the what. This is what the book of Romans is. So now we ask about the when. When was this written? It was written around 57 AD. 57 AD. Which is amazing, by the way, when you put this into chronological history. Jesus was crucified somewhere between 30 AD and 33 AD, depending on which scholars you listen to. Between 30 and 33 AD. Which means that this gospel that Paul's writing about was written within 25 years of the death of Jesus. Like this gospel was not spelled out hundreds of years after Jesus' death. It was 25 years after Jesus' death. That wasn't very long ago. For those of you doing the math, that would be like 1997. How many of y'all remember 97? Like that's not that long ago. Like I was just about to get married in 1997. I remember that very well. Um, Princess Diana had just died in 97, for those of you who remember that. Uh, the first Harry Potter book was released in 97, for you Harry Potter fans. That was 25 years ago, by the way. The Titanic movie just came out in 1997. The Toy Story movie was already two years old. Yeah, that made you feel old, right? Top Gun was over a decade old by 97. You just went and saw number two, and you're like, oh, yeah, I remember that. No, it was, it was already a decade old by 97, just so you know. 25 years ago, it wasn't that long. This gospel that Paul's describing, it wasn't ancient history when he's writing this. He was writing it in a world filled with people who saw it, who were there. And it was already changing the world in Rome. 25 years. Where was it written? Who, what, when, where? It was written actually probably from the city of Corinth. The Apostle Paul set up camp there in Corinth for about two years, wrote several letters while he was doing ministry in the city of Corinth. Uh, that doesn't matter a whole ton, but there will be a few tie-ins that we'll make. And Paul's in Corinth as he's writing this letter to the Romans. The biggest question is, why is he writing it? Why this letter? And I want to give you two reasons there's probably way more than this, but here are two that I think are really important. Here's the first one. He's writing it to explain the gospel. Again, we've got to put this into context. Most of the places that Paul would plant a church, he would go in, he would share the gospel. Again, like Corinth, he would literally spend a year or two in Ephesus, in Corinth, in Thessalonica. He would go there, he'd set up shop, and he'd preach the gospel to them over and over and over. He'd share the good news of Jesus. He didn't do that in Rome. And so he wants to make sure that these people in Rome truly understand the gospel. If they really were just at the day of Pentecost and they heard some early teaching from the apostles, they understood what it means to follow Jesus a little, but they did not have a fleshed out version of the gospel. And so up to this point, we know of no apostle that has been in Rome with this church. And so he wants to make sure these people understand the gospel of Jesus. And if no apostle's been there to teach them, i got to do it. And, and so he's got to figure out a way to teach them from a distance. There ain't no Zoom calls that he can do, right? There's no streaming service. He ain't burning CDs and mailing them. You millennials, we used to actually take these plastic discs and we bring... <laughs> He's got to figure out, how do I teach them the gospel from a distance? And so he methodically writes it down, anticipating every argument that somebody might give in counterpoint to what he's saying, and he fleshes it out word for word, line by line, with... with uh, 
with an accuracy that we don't have anywhere else in the New Testament because we don't need it anywhere else. Because he shared it in person everywhere else. But he needs to do it from a distance with them. And we then are the beneficiaries of this, this written down version of the gospel. So he writes, writes it to explain the gospel. And secondly, he writes it to expand the kingdom. He writes it to expand the kingdom. What I mean is, by the time you get to verse, or sorry, chapter 15, the Apostle Paul is going to say to the church in Rome, hey, I can't wait to see you, but you just need to know I ain't sticking around. Like, the reason Paul, in his desire to go to Rome, is so that he can then go to Spain. Like, you'll hear Paul's heart. Paul's heart is, I want to share the gospel in places that it has never been before. And essentially he says, I have covered all of the Mediterranean Sea. I've, every town I've gone to, I've already shared the gospel. I don't want to build on anybody else's foundation. I want to go to places that have never heard. And I've run out of territory. So I'm going to stop by Rome. Can't wait to see you. But the real reason I'm stopping by is I'm hoping you'll help me get to Spain. Like I'm going to go to Spain and I'm going to preach the gospel in Spain. They haven't heard it yet. I'm going to Spain. And it would be really, really helpful if you guys could prep, because I'm coming, and help me get to Spain. So he's trying to get them, this church, to be the launching point to take the gospel to places that it has never been before. So we'll get to that in chapter 15, somewhere around 2026. (laughs) So what's the point for us today? What's the takeaway today? Here, if you did your literary, ever went to journalistic school, like you got the who, what, when, where, why, and we often tag on another one that's not really a W, but we throw it on at the end anyway, and that is the, the how. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. So I want to throw in a how today. How do we, how do we get the most out of the book of Romans? That's what I want to end with today. I got five things I want to give you real quick as applications for how we can get the most out. First one is this. Come prepared. Like come prepared. Don't come passively. Come expectantly. Come purposefully. Come ready. This letter has literally transformed the lives of millions of people. It has started nearly every great revival in the last 20 centuries. We need to come ready for God to do that through us. So I'm asking you, make a commitment to be here, to be engaged, to show up, leaning forward, notebook in hand, Bible in your lap. Come prepared for God to do something great among us. No doubt there are going to be some weeks that you miss. The year's a long time. But let's make that the exception, not the rule. Let's come prepared for God to do something in us. Here's the second thing. Grow beyond Sunday. Like if the only... If your only engagement into the book of Romans is the 35 minutes when I'm screaming at you, you're going to miss it. There's going to be so much that you miss. So so get engaged beyond Sunday. Again, that's why we're doing these notebooks. There's questions in there for you to dig deeper into the text. The entire text is in there to take notes and write in the margins. I've written all of the text will be in there for you to underline and highlight if you got questions, then, then you can write questions down. You can talk with them with people in your, in your groups. Uh, we have table talk discussions for you to do with your family. Our students are going to be engaged in this same so you can have conversations. Grow beyond Sunday. Every month we're going to invite you to do a memory verse. Like legit, like kids doing memory verses because this is the greatest letter in the greatest book of all time and so we're going to help you to try to get the greatest verses from the greatest book in the greatest book from the greatest letter of all time into our hearts and into our minds so dig in memorize some of these scriptures and let God use them so grow beyond Sunday number three get connected like find a group find some people to engage with the church is supposed to be communal Again, if your only connection is sitting here staring at the back of the head of the person in front of you, you're never going to get connected. I mean, there's going to be some some lively debates that are going to happen. There are going to be some really intense conversations that are going to go on as we dig into the book of Romans. Again, before we even get out of chapter 1, 
you're going to want, you're going to want some people. You're going to need a place to go to tell people just how wrong I am. I mean, you screaming that in your shower by yourself is going to bring no gratification. You're going to need some people to hear you vent about how wrong I am. So get a group. Number four, subscribe to the podcast. Okay, this is something we're doing new for this series. We're going to record it every Monday. It'll drop every Tuesday. Every place where you find your podcast, you can find this podcast. It's called The Gospel for everyone. Again, there's so much material in these verses that we're not going to be able to cover in 35 minutes on a Sunday. This is an opportunity for you to engage in the conversation past Sunday. If you have questions that we didn't answer in the text or you want to tell me how wrong I am, you can actually do that through our podcast. In the front of your booklet, there is a number that you can text all of your questions to. All of your arguments, too, you can text them to that, and we'll address them as much as we can through this podcast. Again, it drops every Tuesday, and if you struggle and you say, I don't know how to do a podcast, just come out to Pastor's Point or Connection Central, and one of our millennials will help you. (laughs) Here's number five. Read the text. Just read the text. In the next week... I'm just asking you to read it. Just read, read the book of Romans. Like, it's like science class. Like, over the next year, we're going to dissect the frog. Like we're going to cut off its feet and look at its fingers. And we're going to pull it out. So that's the heart. And we're going to dissect the frog. But there's glory in the, seeing the frog alive. Seeing it all together. Doing what it's supposed to do. Before we dice it up into pieces. I'm going to invite you to read the text. Like when this thing first dropped in Rome, somebody walked up to the front of the gathering of the churches in Rome and they read this thing out loud and they felt the weight of those first four chapters and they're like, oh my gosh. But by the time they get to Romans chapter 8 verse 1 and where Paul says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Like a whoop went up in the room because they had just been told how terrible they were. They felt the weight of it all. And we're going to dice it up, and it's going to be easy to miss that. So I just want to invite you to read it. Over the next 168 hours, read the thing. Like to read it in one sitting, I ask a few staff people to do that, to just see how long it would take. It took me about an hour. I'm a slow reader from Kentucky. It's hard letters. It took me about an hour. One of our staff members says it took him like 35 minutes, and I think he's lying. I think he just just skimmed the thing. I don't know how you do that. But likely you're going to fall somewhere in between. Somewhere between 30 minutes and an hour. You can sit down and read the whole thing. You've got 168 hours between now and next week. Read the thing. Let me end with this. There's a scholar, pastor, commentator named F.F. Bruce. And... And he, in his introduction to his commentary on the book of Romans, here's what he writes. There is no saying what may happen when people begin to study the letter to the Romans. So, let those who have read thus far be prepared for the consequences of reading further. You have been warned. I love that. Like, what he's saying is, look, 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 look. God does Amazing things when people take the time to study this thing. And we're going to open it up and we're going to dig in and we want God to do amazing stuff in us. It has the potential to change us. Every great revival begins with the book of Romans. Now we do not have the power in us to ignite a revival in our city, in our quad city area. We don't have the ability to ignite a revival in our state or in our country. We can't ignite revivals, but we can gather the wood. And that's what we're doing. Studying Romans is like gathering up the wood and we're just begging God, light it aflame for us. 
So that's what we're asking you to do. Be prepared for God to do something great. And let's marvel at him when he does. Father God, we are grateful that you've saved these words for us. This glorious picture of the gospel. And I pray that you would begin to light a fire in us that begins to ignite for the people around us that begins a revival throughout the Quad City area. And we'll give you glory when it happens. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.